Okay, so going back to our formula here, we've got again cardiac output, stroke volume times heart rate. So now we're going to spend some time looking at the other factor here. So we established the factors that influence the heart rate, right? That's the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, and then the hormone uh, epinephrine and the hormone glucagon. Now we're gonna look at the factors that affect the stroke volume. So the other variable in this formula for cardiac output. So uh, the primary factors that affect stroke volume are the ventricular contractility, the end diastolic volume, we'll talk about, remind ourselves what that is in a minute, and then the afterload. So the first one is the ventricular contractility. Um, more forceful contractions mean more blood is expelled or ejected from the ventricle, and that is the effect of sympathetic control on the ventricular myocardial cells. And if you remember, I said the sympathetic system influences the SA node, the AV node, as well as the cardiac, um, the cardiac myocytes, the contractile cells of the myocardium, um, but the parasympathetic system does not influence these uh, contractile cells. So only the sympathetic system will influence the ventricular contraction. And under that influence, we're going to have norepinephrine binding to these beta-1 receptors. That is going to stimulate cyclic AMP second messenger. And the effect that we see in contractile cells is augmenting the length of time that calcium channels are open. And we, rem we should remember that if calcium channels are open for longer periods, more calcium will enter the cell and that's going to bring about sustained contractions or more forceful contractions. And that's how we get increase in stroke volume uh, under the influence of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, we also increase the amount of calcium that's released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, we increase the myosin ATPase rate, so that's the rate of the myosin heads in this cardiac muscle. Um, and then we increase the calcium ATPase pump on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, and just to make some sense here, the calcium ATPase activity is the calcium pumps that are clearing the calcium from the cytosol in order to cease muscle contraction. So as a part of speeding up the rate here, we not only want to pump calcium into the cytoplasm so that we can have faster muscle contractions, but we want to pump it out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum um, at a faster rate so that we can relax in between those contractions quickly as well. So here is a schematic um, which kind of shows that. So we've got the beta-1 receptors, that is coupled to a G-stimulatory protein. We've got our second messenger. Protein kinase will influence the L-type calcium channels that are inserted into the membrane. And so these channels are going to be open for longer durations of time. That is going to stimulate more calcium coming into the cell. Secondly, we have uh, the calcium channels that are on the sarcoplasmic reticulum. They are also opened for longer periods of time, so more calcium will go from the SR into the cytosol as well. Thirdly, we have a faster rate in the myosin ATPase activity, so there's going to be a faster cross-bridge cycle rate, which will um, influence our contractility. And then lastly, we have the calcium ATPase pump that's pumping calcium back into the cytosol. So as I mentioned, all four of these events will increase the weight of ventricular contraction. Um, so not only are we pumping more calcium out to uh, generate more forceful contractions, but we're also pumping more calcium into the SR at a faster rate as well, so that we can increase the rate of relaxation in between those contractions as well. And then we've got faster myosin ATPase activity um, that's augmenting that as well. And so all four of these events bring about more forceful contractions of the myocardium, which will increase stroke volume. So here we can see that at rest, this is the amount of tension or force that's generated by the cardiac myocyte. Um, at rest, 
it's going to generate this black curve here, right? So not very much tension or a moderate amount of tension rather over a longer period of time. Whereas under sympathetic influence, because of those four uh, variables we just mentioned, it's going to generate a lot more force in a shorter amount of time. Um, and then here, the parasympathetic in influence, we said there's no parasympathetic innovation to the contractile cells. So there is not uh, any significance of parasympathetic uh, involvement when it comes to contractility. Um, hormones here are going to be the same. Epinephrine is going to be acting just like um, the sympathetic nervous system by binding to those beta-1 receptors and bringing about those same four events, right? Increase in myosin ATPase activity, increase in calcium ATPase activity, augmenting the calcium channels on the SR, augmenting the calcium channels on the membrane. All of those events are also brought about by the hormone epinephrine. And then we've got a few other hormones here that also influence contractility. Thyroid hormone, we should know. We talked about thyroid hormone in the endocrine system. It's going to increase the metabolic rate of all of our tissues, all of our cells. And so the heart muscle will also be under that influence. Um, insulin and glucagon also increase the weight of the, um, the force of contraction, which will increase contractility and increase stroke volume as well. The mechanisms of these two, again, are not exactly clear, but they do increase the contractility. All right, the second factor we talked about was end diastolic volume. The second factor that influences stroke volume. Um, and so end diastolic volume is basically the amount of blood that fills into the heart. Um, so at the end of diastole, how much blood was actually filled into that ventricle? Now, if we look at Starling's law, Starling's law says that if we increase the stretch of the muscle fibers of the heart, the fibers, are, the fibers get closer to their optimal length, and so they're going to generate more forceful contractions. And so what that means is that if I stretch my ventricular fibers wider or larger, these fibers are going to generate more force and are going to pump or eject that blood more forcefully. And so this is how the heart can intrinsically regulate its own stroke volume. A greater degree of stretch will elicit a greater or more forceful contraction. Um, so if we increase the venous return, which is the amount of blood that filled into the ventricle, we're going to increase the stroke volume, which is the amount uh, of blood that actually gets pumped out of that ventricle. And that is what Starling's law indicates. And that is how end diastolic volume also translates to increased stroke volume. So here, if we compare stroke volume to the end diastolic volume, um, we see that if we increase the end diastolic volume, we significantly increase the stroke volume. So this curve is kind of directly proportional in that the, I don't think we talked about this in terms of muscle, but the uh, fiber length gets closer to its optimal length and it's going to begin to generate more force the more further apart that it's stretched. And so that's what that curve is indicating. An increase in stroke volume results in an increase in, sorry, an increase in end diastolic volume results in an increase in stroke volume. And again, this is also showing that three different curves here. We've got decreased sympathetic activity. We've got kind of at rest in between and then increased sympathetic activity. And what we see is that end diastolic volume increases, or, or uh, sorry, stroke volume increases, although end diastolic volume stays the same. And that is because of the increased sympathetic activity. So although we have the same amount of end diastolic volume, if we've got an increase in the sympathetic influence on the myocytes, they are going to work harder. They're going to pump more blood out. They're going to increase the stroke volume, even for a given or constant end diastolic volume. Um, okay, factors affecting the end diastolic volume are going to be preload. So that's going to be the end diastolic pressure. Um, that's going to include the filling time, so how long it took for that ventricle to fill, the atrial pressure, how much force or how much um, uh, 
pressure the atria is actually contracting with that will also influence the end diastolic volume. And then the central venous pressure is the pressure that is in the veins that are returning back into that atrium. So if we have more pressure in the veins, bringing more blood back into the atria, we're obviously going to fill more blood into that ventricle. So these three factors independently influence end diastolic volume. And then we know that end diastolic volume influences stroke volume. Um, and then afterload is also a factor. Afterload is the pressure in the aorta after, um, during ejection. So it's basically the resistance that the blood that's leaving the ventricle has to work against. We call that afterload. So if you've got um, narrowed vessels or we've got a lot of pressure, if someone has high blood pressure, a lot of pressure in the distal vessels, the uh, force of that ventricle is going to have to work even harder to pump blood against that resistance. So if we have an increase in afterload, we will also see that affecting our end diastolic volume. 